Hello, and thank you for joining us for the 23rd Annual Virtual Elder Abuse Conference, Serving Older Adults During Times of Isolation. This conference is presented by the Syracuse Area Domestic and Sexual Violence Coalition's Elder Justice Committee. My name is Lori DiCaprio Lee, and I am the ID Theft and Outreach Coordinator at Vera House. Before we begin today's presentation, I'd like to acknowledge some recent events. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted issues of inequality. Older adults, those who live in poverty, and members of Black and Brown communities have been more severely impacted. The Elder Justice Committee values all older adults and stands in solidarity with the Black community. We pledge to uplift the voices of Black people in our community and strive to fight the injustices that have led us to this moment. Thank you. So moving on to other announcements, all webinars offered during this conference are free thanks to the generous support of our sponsors. And I want to particularly recognize our platinum sponsors, Loretto, and the Onondaga County Department of Adult and Long-Term Care Services, our gold sponsors, Syracuse Jewish Family Service and Wegmans, and our silver sponsors, the Alzheimer's Association of CNY, At Home Independent Living, Community Bank, Countryside Federal Credit Union, Krause Health, Fulton Savings Bank, Syracuse University School of Social Work, and Touching Hearts at Home. More information about all of our sponsors can be found on the Vera House website. The support of these sponsors not only funds this webinar series, but also extends beyond the conference to continue elder abuse education and prevention outreach after the event. And one last announcement before we begin. The chat feature is disabled. However, you can ask questions using the Q&A. So today's webinar is Adults in Aging Services During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And we have two presenters, Joanne Spoto-Decker, the Executive Director and Deputy Commissioner at the Onondaga County Department of Adults and Long-Term Care Services, and Natalie Rohn, caseworker at the Onondaga County Adult Protective Services. And so with that, I will turn it over to our speakers and start the PowerPoint. Thank you, Lori. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I've been involved with the annual Elder Abuse Conference since 1999. The event topics remain extremely relevant every passing day. I want to thank everyone listening in today. Each of you knows how challenging the past months have been during the COVID-19 pandemic. For the Department of Adult and Long-Term Care Services, Office for Aging, the pandemic has changed the way we act and think during a crisis. Next slide, please. Under the leadership of Onondaga County Executive, a senior nutrition hotline was established to assist seniors and healthcare workers with food and other supplies. The hotline number was unique and calls went to contact community services, the agency responsible for 211. Next slide, please. Referrals for food and other essential items were sent to the Office for Aging and managed by the Senior Nutrition Unit here. Partnering and coordinating with multiple agencies and providers such as Meals on Wheels, the Rescue Mission, Food Bank of Central New York, the Salvation Army, Peace Incorporated, the United Way, and many, many other community-based organizations, systems were set up and put in place to provide and deliver nutritious meals and groceries to those in need. 
as of this very day, we have received 2,901 referrals from county residents. Data through May 20th, or May of 2020, excuse me, shows the collective pandemic response provided more than 102,000 meals. 902 boxes of groceries were delivered, equating to 22,550 meals. Takeout meals were delivered from our senior centers. Many of our homebound seniors were provided with shopper services, as many could not afford private services or they did not have the technology necessary to use the online services. Within our department, we have New York Connect and the Long-Term Care Resource Center. I'll talk about those in a few minutes. But during the pandemic, our relationship with assisted living facilities our staff worked together with Onondaga County Emergency Management during the proactive testing at all assisted living facilities. We've been very fortunate and delivered thousands and th thousands and thousands of masks. And we continue to do so to organizations, businesses, faith communities, and basically anyone who calls our senior nutrition hotline requesting one hand sanitizers, adult diapers, milk distribution, cleaning and paper supplies. Supplies have been distributed throughout the community with the help of staff from the Office for Aging. One of the biggest changes in the way the Office for Aging conducts businesses during the pandemic is the age of the people that we are serving. About 18% of the 2,901 referrals to date, a little over 500 people are from county residents under the age of 60. As we enter the different phases of community transition, the Office for Aging will be reviewing how we responded these past several weeks, what worked well, what we could use improvement on, and how we capitalize on the information we have to develop a data-driven plan for our vulnerable seniors for future emergencies. So next slide, please. And we have our next slide, please. Sorry, Joanna, froze up on me. Okay. Um, I will keep trying if you wanna keep talking. <laughs> okay, I'll keep talking. In 2014, the Adult and Long-Term Care Services Department was established, and it is established to serve persons 18 years of age and older. So the thought process at that time was that this is the best way to, have ever, to provide more efficient services to people of all ages seeking aging services, services from New York Connects, our Long-Term Care Resource Center, mental health, and of course, adult protective services, which you'll be hearing about very soon. Next slide, please. The mission of the Office for Aging is to improve and enrich the quality of life for all older persons in Onondaga County. And this pandemic has shown us that now more than ever, our mission resonates in every aspect of what we plan and do. Next slide, please. What does the Office for Aging provide? It provides a wide range of cost-effective community-based services. And when we talk about why we do what we do, we talk about delaying the high expense of institutional care, and you'll see how we do that shortly, how we support aging well, and how we assist caregivers and their families. So right now I'd like to talk about our programs and services and how we get all of this accomplished. So I think we'll need to see our next slide. The Office for Aging, all of the offices for aging in New York State, and many of you listening today are not from Onondaga County and are from other office area agencies on aging across the state, so welcome. 
And Offices for Aging have four core programs that are mandated by the Older Americans Act. And those four programs are nutrition, ISIP, that's the expanded in-home services for the elderly, community services, one that's near and dear to my heart because that's what I worked in for many, many years, and caregiver services. So I want to talk a little bit about each one of those and also talk about what impact the pandemic has had on providing these services. So I think I need to see the next slide. Part of community services is information and assistance. We have staffing in the office to provide county residents and caregivers through um, uh, assessing what the person needs when they call, explaining eligibility requirements. We follow up with the person when it's necessary. But most of the time, a lot of our calls, particularly now because of the pandemic, is responding to families in crisis. People are looking for, as I just said, the meals programs. They're looking for essentials for hand sanitizer, for masks, for those types of things. And they're also looking for someone to be on the other line to reassure them that things are going to be okay. So the information and assistance line has changed just a little bit in the pandemic and that we are hearing from people who are needing more basic needs. Next slide, please. Our nutrition services. You heard me just talk a few minutes earlier about all of the work our nutrition director and our nutrition coordinator have been doing. There were just two people on that line, by the way, that were, were, were working with all those people. Before the pandemic, we had 36 senior meal sites in Onondaga County. I'll get to that in just a second. But the core services that we had prior to the pandemic were nutrition counseling and education, the senior dining sites, I just mentioned, 36 of them. Senior farmer market nutrition program, the senior farmer market coupons, and Natalie is smiling right here, so she can attest to the extremely popular program. Those of you in the Office for Aging know that as well. That is going on, and we're looking right now on how we're going to get those coupons out to people in a, in a safe manner. Uh, last year, we served 1,960 uh, people with farmer's market coupons with a value of about $40,000. <clears> and that helps our local farmers, as, as many of you know. We also have home delivered meals. Essential, very essential to what's been happening in the pandemic. But what's changed in the nutrition services unit, or at least for Onondaga County, we closed our meal sites uh, March, by March 13th or 14th. So we had 36 meal sites and an average of maybe 50 or 75 people at meal sites. That's a lot of people who, um, who were without lunch. So what happened during that is we had to change our model a little bit and that we were looking for serving people through our senior dining sites through drive through meal sites. So uh, as we move forward into the weeks and into the months of this, more and more of our dining sites are looking at providing drive through meals. Our nutrition director is working on safety standards right now with the, with the dining sites so they can open safely and efficiently and follow the rules and regulations of our local governance in, in doing so. So we are very excited to begin to do that. Some of our nutrition dining sites were able to do that almost from the beginning um, within the city of Syracuse and a few in, the, um, in our rural areas. The thing about uh, Onondaga County, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, and it's very geographically diverse. We have the city of Syracuse, the suburbs, and then we have where I'm from, a very rural out area in called Elbridge, New York. So it is uh, challenging to, uh, to meet the needs of people, uh, particularly with a lack of transportation and um, what was going on with the pandemic through our dining sites, but we're working through that very successfully. So nutrition services is a core, everybody knows about home delivered meals, our home delivered meal units where we're really re-imaging and repackaging literally 
what we were doing in delivering frozen meals to limit the contact with, um, you know, with the people that we serve in our Meals on Wheels volunteers. The next slide, please. Our expanded in-home services for the elderly program, an in-home non-medical care to help Royal individuals 60 years of age and older. Our ISIP program is completely state funded. So it's funded by New York State Office for Aging. And I'm so, so proud of this program. I was, I've been here a long time, as I said, and uh, it was a small program back in, when I got here in 99, and uh, stayed that way till about 2005 or six when the governance in New York State realized that um, it was much more cost effective to provide personal care services and light housekeeping to people in their home rather than uh, costly institutional care. So New York State doubled uh, at that time the budget for expanded in-home services for the elderly and helped so many more people. So we're very proud of, of New York State for that. And next slide, please. ISA provides a lot of things. It provides, as I said, um, personal care services, but it also provides adult day programs, a pers emer per personal emergency response system, and also care management and case management. Some, what I would say absolutely fabulous ISA case management, case managers that we have. What happened to ISIP in the pandemic? Some of the challenges that our, our um, elderly services coordinator has, uh, has worked so closely with to help overcome. We had some of our adult day programs, all of our adult day programs close. Some are reopening right now, following standards of, of local governance and safety. But we also had seniors who, uh, as I'm sure Natalie can talk, speak to about adult protective services, did not want their aides in their home. So there was those type of issues. Additionally, um, our waiting list has grown and grown and grown here in Onondaga County. And I know that it is um, something that's happening statewide. Uh, the lack of aids and personal care aids here in this county um, is one of the reasons why. But uh, the pandemic really didn't have an impact on that so much as it did where we were not able to provide some of these core services that ISIP has, like the adult aid program. Uh, personal emergency response, we still have. Our ISIP case managers, because New York State Office for Aging had um, told us back in March, do not make face-to-face -face visits, but all of their assessments are still completed uh, over the telephone. So, uh, Next slide, please. And next slide, please. Sorry, Joanna, it happened again. All right, all right. I'm going to talk about caregiver services. Under our caregiver services program, we have, which is another core service mandated by on the Older Americans Act, we provide advice to families in crisis. A lot of times, most times, when we get calls from caregivers, they have tried everything. They have knocked on every door. They have, they have done whatever they can. They're stressed out. And we are there across, across the state, all caregiver services programs to help people in, in crisis. We have an in-home respite program here in Onondaga County. We, of course, have social adult day programming and we have caregiver discussion groups. And from my view, as the executive director here, um, this program has probably been uh, the most impacted in terms of service delivery because uh, the caregiver discussion groups usually were held at, um, they may be held at senior centers. They may be held at uh, assisted living facilities. They might be held in, in senior apartment buildings. So we're not able to, to have that face-to-face -face contact and we're not able to provide those, those classes, those discussion groups at this time. So we're working on that and hopefully we will be able to resume that um, when, we, when we have a safety plan. Our social adult day programming was a wonderful respite 
for the caregiver. Uh, that, of course, um, also was impacted by the, um, by the pandemic. In-home respite is still provided, but again, we have that, that carryover where people might not want um, uh, personal care aid to go into the home. So caregiver services is really one, at least in my view, one of, uh, one of our core services that was, that was pretty impacted by, uh, by the pandemic. And hopefully as we move forward into the next phase, um, we'll be able to just start resuming some of the things for our, for our beloved caregivers. And next slide, please. Community service programs. This is the one that I had the most experience with um, in the Office for Aging for, for many, many years. So I'll just go by them very quickly. Our home repair program, uh, that provides uh, small repairs for persons 60 years of age and older. And it's targeted, like a lot of our programs, to persons with um, um, low-income individuals. And we, that particular program is extremely popular. We run it through Catholic Charities of Onondaga County. Uh, right now, it is on pause because of the pandemic and going into people's homes. So we are working with our, our partners at Catholic Charities, and hopefully we will be able to, um, to resume. I'll skip over to legal services. Legal services has continued remotely uh, to help our uh, seniors and from their older American unit. They were looking particularly at cases where people were, had pending evictions and, uh, and other financial issues due to COVID-19. Our senior shopper services, that is provided by a company called Time Savers here in Onondaga County. So we've had this particular shopper service program since 2009. This program was created by the Office for Aging in response to our public hearings that we hold, and those of you in the Office for Aging know that, that we hold annually, and also from uh, many other stakeholders and many of our case managers who are saying, they want me to go, people want me to go shopping for them. I can't take, my agency won't let me take their money. So we created this program. It's been extremely popular over the years. And here we are 11 years later, and uh, it's more popular than ever. And we're very grateful for the Senior Shopper Service to be able to help us even more so during the pandemic. Our Senior Center activities, uh, exercise classes, um, I, everything that happens in a senior center, uh, all the education classes, all of the outreach that we do, that is a course on hold right now. It's on pause. Uh, we are looking at, um, at resuming some of them. Some of our senior centers are going to start outdoor exercise classes. So that's pretty exciting. So we're looking at really different ways to keep people safe, but that's our main goal and main concern. Uh, we have a program that is near and dear to my heart as somebody with sensory loss. It is Social Work Services through Aurora of Central New York. Aurora helps us with, uh, helps us with seniors who have vision and hearing loss. And it, we are, um, some other contiguous counties also work with Aurora of Central New York to, uh, to help our seniors live safely at home. That program has been with us since I started I'm with the Office for Aging back in, in 1999. I'd like to take credit for that one, but I can't. Transportation. Everyone knows how critical transportation is, and it even more so during the pandemic for people who are, aren't able to drive, can't drive, don't have anybody to take them, and have transportation services to get to where they need to go, important doctor's offices and things that we do um, on, a, on a regular basis. We are proud in Onondaga County to have 16 different transportation programs. Some are um, rural and rural areas. Most of the rural areas are volunteer programs that we support. We support several in the city of Syracuse and uh, in some of the suburbs. We also have an assisted escorted transportation program that is open to anyone in Onondaga County who has a, a medical issue that needs to be um, that needs sedation and has no one else to take them. We will take them in on our program. We will 
have assisted escorted, so the person would be escorted into the building, into the medical procedure. A person would stay there and stay until that medical procedure was done and take that person home. So it's a, uh, it, it's a great program for people who really have been giving up things that they needed, medical treatments that they needed to have, and uh, because they couldn't, they couldn't find anybody or didn't have anybody to take them. That program is also the result Office for Aging People Listening, from uh, our public hearings. So we're very proud of that one too. Our Neighborhood Advisor Program is an information and assistance program. We subcontract that with several community-based organizations uh, within Onondaga County. Neighborhood Advisors make home visits and they do outreach for our services. We go looking for clients with our Neighborhood Advisor Program right now. Um, our neighborhood advisors are doing telephone, telephonic work. They are not making home visits. So we're working with their agencies to, uh, to begin to see when we can start home visiting in a safe manner once again. I'm not saying it's going to be very soon, but, uh, but we are looking ahead at it. So our neighborhood advisors uh, uh, signature program. In many other counties, the work that they do, helping people fill out uh, SNAP applications, helping people connect to uh, other benefits and other programs that uh, help seniors are provided by uh, Office for Aging staff, county staff. In our county, we subcontract that out to community-based organizations. So the neighborhood advisors work where people live and they live where people work. So it is a really good plus plus for us to provide services and, uh, and also respect uh, the scholarship of diversity and cultural competence through that program. Our next slide, please. I'll go through them quickly because I want to make sure Natalie has, uh, has some time. Our HRTAP, our Health Insurance Information Counseling and Assistance Program is also part of what we do here in community services. And if I can have the next slide, Hi, CAP, Health Insurance Counseling. Everyone in the Office for Aging knows what we do with that, it's particularly around the open enrollment period that's coming uh, quickly uh, so at the end of the year. So we work with people about uh, Medicare, any, anything to do with Medicare, help understand bills, provide information. Um, we also look at um, person's eligibility, for not just for health insurance counseling, but if we see that they may be eligible for other programs like SNAP or, um, or extra help from the Social Security Administration, we also connect them to those. We have one uh, volunteer, um, coordinator working right now and we have five PICAP counselors. What happened with the COVID impact is that face-to-face -face visits with our um, with our seniors or Medicare beneficiaries of any age are on pause and everything is done electronically. Next slide, please. Another part of community services is our home energy assistance program. Uh, everybody is familiar with HEAP. One of the things, again, that we do with HEAP is that we work very closely with Part, Onondaga County Department of Social Services, Economic Security. And we make home visits to persons that cannot come down to where we're located in downtown Syracuse. They can't get to the Civic Center, but they've got a broken furnace and, um, you know, in the middle of winter or right before a holiday. So we're able to, at least we're able to go to their home, make sure that we had all the necessary paperwork to get that service, uh, to get their furnace and the service fixed in, a, in an expeditious manner. Right now, due to the pandemic, um, we, we still have people that, that need home visits for other things like um, um, SNAP applications and so on. We're not able to make those home visits right now, but we will be resuming them in partnership with the Department of Social Services, Economic Security. But the main focus of PEEP like as, is to get the word out. We have more than 50 outreach sites during the heat season at a variety of diverse locations here in Onondaga County. So we make sure that uh, those who are eligible for heat 
take part in that benefit. I've just got a few more slides. The next one will deal with our health promotion. Those are the programs that we have right now, living healthy with a chronic condition, healthy eating for successful living, walk with ease, and PEARLS, which is an evidence or all evidence-based programs. PEARLS, of course, is a mental health evidence-based program. In Onondaga County, we work with OASIS. What's happening with those? Obviously, they were all congregate uh, classes. So right now, I'm very proud to say that all of them are, are the uh, living healthy with a chronic condition, healthy eating, and not walk with ease. But some of them are um, being presented on Zoom. So we've added Zoom classes for Tai Chi and, uh, and chronic disease self-management. So we're working with our provider, Oasis, and they, at us, they are doing a fantastic job in making sure that people are, stay connected and uh, with, um, with our evidence-based program. And almost lastly is our next slide. It's our SHARP program, Senior Health and Resource Partnership Project. That is a five-year geriatric mental health demonstration grant that we received. We're currently in year four. And as you can see from our bullet points, we serve people 55 years of age and older with addiction, depression, or other mental health issues. We have two care managers. They um, actually, they're care coordinators, and one, is, one of them is our primary coordinator and um, of the program. We also have an aging services specialist who works with them. So when the people that we see that are 55 and older, we have the opportunity to connect with our mental health providers and get the counseling that they need. And we also, in the other way, have the um, mental health counselor partners send clients to the SHARP project who need aging services. So it's really a triangular approach to serving people and it's worked quite well over the past uh, four years. We've seen a, a, no pun intended, a sharp decline in, uh, in the PH29 scores of people who participate in our program. What's happened though with the SHARP project, like every place else almost, except Adult Protective and Nancy, uh, as uh, Natalie's gonna talk about, is that we're not able to see people face to face. So we, um, we are continuing telehealth and, uh, and that's going quite well. Another thing about this particular program is that there is no cost to participate in this program. So if you, um, if you do not have health, health insurance that covers uh, mental health counseling, the, the demonstration, demonstration project will pick up that cost. Increase in referrals? Absolutely. Since the pandemic, we've seen a, an increase in referrals. Interestingly, it was self-referrals. So the word of mouth is getting out there in our, you know, in our senior housing and uh, through all kinds of venues. So we're seeing a, um, a spike in our referrals because of the short project. Luckily, we've got a great team and they are able to, to respond almost within the next day in, co in contacting people. When I said we were the Department of Adult and Long-Term Care Services at the beginning, I said we had mental health. So the next slide will just give a brief description of what we're doing with our mental health services. Planning, quality improvement, and training. We also have a SPOA, a single point of access services. We have assisted outpatient treatment dual recovery and peer engagement. We contract with for many community services through our mental health. Also, the past couple of years, we've been doing outreach and to the downtown to people downtown who are homeless and vulnerable and helping them connect to housing and services. So particularly now um, our mental health services are, um, are so vital and so important. In, uh, in helping keep our community um, safe. And lastly, I also talked at the beginning about New York Connects and the Long-Term Care Resource Center. So if I could see the next and the last slide for me. Our New York Connects office provides information, assistance, and resources 
on long-term care services and supports of any age. So we do, um, when we can, when we could, we would do assessments in a person's home. Uh, we also do them over the phone and we get many, many referrals online. So our New York Connects office is, like every other county office for aging, is so extremely busy. And the pandemic is changing some of the, uh, some of what's going on with the calls and what people are saying. So many, many, many people looking for services and looking for resources. So we are glad that um, our New York Connects office is responding accordingly. Our long-term care resource center is our nursing unit. We provide services similar to the ISA program, expanded in-home services for the elderly. The ISA program is for persons that do not participate in the Medicaid program. The Long-Term Care Resource Center is for persons exclusively who participate in the Medicaid program. So we also work with the community in doing patient review instruments so people can go into assisted living facilities or nursing homes. And we work very closely with adult protective services and uh, making joint home visits to people who may need emergent medical care. So that's our department. And those are the things that we've been doing before and uh, during and, and we, what we can resume after the pandemic. So thank you very much. And I'll be open to any questions at the end of our presentation. And I am going to move my chair and, uh, and have Natalie Rowan come to the, come to the camera. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for having me. I am going to talk about Adult Protective Services, which is one of the departments under the Office of Aging and Long-Term Care. Um, next slide, please. Okay, you can give me the next slide. Thank you. <laughs> Adult Protective Services is a state-mandated program that um, falls under the auspices of the Office of Family and Children's Services. Um, it is a program that is aimed for adults ages 18 or older who because of mental or physical impairments can no longer provide for their basic needs, cannot protect themselves from neglect, abuse, or hazardous situations, and have no one willing and or able to help in a responsible manner. And all of this is done without regard to anyone's income. There are no income requirements or no income minimums or maximums. Next slide. The mission of APS or Adult Protective Services is a system of services aimed at maintaining individuals in the community as long as possible, rather than institutionalizing them. Our goal is to try and keep people where they are, whether it be their own home, their own apartment, um, living with relatives as long as possible, rather than trying to place them in a nursing home or some type of other assisted living facility. Next slide. We have some guiding principles that um, help us when we are trying to do our job. One is the right to self-determination. This is the right that every individual has the ability to exercise their freedom of choice in making their decisions. In essence, as long as someone has capacity, they are allowed to make bad and silly decisions. Whether or not we think it's bad or silly, they have the right to make that decision. The state's authority to intervene, um, meaning that the state um, can act in a parental type capacity for persons who cannot care for themselves or are a danger to themselves, and the least restrictive alternative. Next slide, please. 
APS has three characteristics or requirements for us to become involved with people. The first is physical or mental impairment. The adult must have a physical illness or a disability and or a mental impairment that results in a decreased capacity for self-care and self-determination. And, next slide, they must have the inability to meet essential needs or to protect themselves from harm. The adult must be at risk due to one or more of the following circumstances. Unable to perform essential daily living activities, unable to obtain needed benefits and services, defenseless against abuse by another person, or vulnerable to financial exploitation or other criminal actions, unable or unwilling to manage their personal finances, conditions which present a serious or immediate threat to life, and, next slide, have no one available or willing and able to assist responsibly. A lot of times this means relatives are not willing or able to meet all of the client's essential needs, in other cases, family members may be the ones actually abusing or neglecting the client. Neighbors or friends who have no legal responsibility may hesitate to play more of a limited role with the client. The ability or willingness of other agencies must be weighed against the client's needs. It may be necessary for the social services district to maintain an active role in the provision of services, and clients whose needs exceed the service capacity of relatives and or providers. All three of these things must be in place for APS to accept a referral. It cannot be one or the other. The client must exhibit all three of these characteristics. Next slide, please. If the client does meet all three of the previous characteristics, then what happens is a referral can be made. And the law requires APS to conduct an investigation whenever it receives an oral or written information concerning a person who is thought to be in need of protective services. APS must accept all referrals made within normal working hours, which is 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., Monday through Friday. We are not a mandated 24-hour service like child protective services. We are not open on weekends, and we don't do um, emergencies in that we're not open at night, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. APS is required to act on all referrals of life-threatening situations within 24 hours, that is one working day, of receipt of the information. All other referrals and investigation is to begin within 72 hours and a home visit is made to the client within three working days. So for example, next week is a holiday. If a referral is made on Thursday, the client probably will not be seen until the following Wednesday or Thursday, as Friday we're not working, and they have the 72 hours, which would be Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So Wednesday would be the day when the client would need to be seen by. Due to the COVID pandemic, not too much has changed in APS because we have been working right along. We are what are considered essential employees. Therefore, we've been open 
just like we have been open prior to the pandemic, all the way through the pandemic. The really the only difference is during the pandemic, when people call to um, make a referral, um, our intake staff is asking more questions regarding the circumstances and scrutinizing the information more closely in regards to the client characteristics. The other thing that has changed is that normally we would do home visits, we would sit down with a client, we would um, assess the client's safety in the home. However, due to the pandemic, we received um, changes to that from New York State. So because of the pandemic, caseworkers um, have changed up how they do things. Um, if the client has access to a computer, a tablet, a smartphone, and they feel safe in doing so, um, we've been doing video chats or conferences. If they have email addresses and they feel safe um, receiving email, we will correspond with the clients via email. And we would um, use telephone contact with the client's family as long as they were not the person responsible for the um, neglect or abuse of that client. Um, we would use friends, neighbors, um, other professionals who are involved with the case to inquire about the client's safety. If there is not an alternative to a home visit, then we would do limited contact, meaning that we would stand on the porch, we would meet someone in the lobby, um, we would meet people in the driveway so that we maintain the CDC suggested six foot social distance. Um, and if for some strange reason that we have to go into the home, we ask the um, questions as to whether or not um, someone in the household is exhibiting any of the COVID um, things such as uh, fever, coughing, sneezing, um, if they've come in contact with anyone who has those symptoms or someone who is ill, or if they've been in contact with someone who's traveled internationally. Um, caseworkers are also required to wear PPE, meaning that caseworkers will have masks, they'll have gowns, they'll have gloves, and they'll have booties. Next slide, please. An assessment or a services plan must be made by APS within 60 days of a referral. The APS worker will assess the risk. They will develop a plan of services if needed. Efforts are made to contact family, friends, neighbors, and other community-based services. A lot of times we will make referrals to in-house all of the programs that Joanne alluded to earlier, or if we have to go outside of um, the county, then we will make referrals to those agencies as needed. Social Services Law Section 473C provides a mean for the Department of Social Services to gain access to a person who may be in need of protective services, but to whom access is being denied. That means if they are living with someone who may be neglecting or abusing them, um, we are able to do what we need to do, which is normally getting police involved, um, getting uh, um, code enforcement for the city. Um, if need be, um, EMT services in order to gain access to our client. If all of that fails, a petition is filed in Supreme Court or County Court, and if granted, authorizes APS accompanied by a police officer to go into the person's home to conduct an assessment. Next slide. 
Services, as I stated before, we will make referrals to the following services. Counseling, case management advocacy, money management, and assist and make referrals to find alter alternative living arrangements for the client. Next slide. Making a referral. Any concerned person, family member, friend, neighbor, health professional, or social worker who sees an individual who because of an impairment is unable to cope with everyday life and is in need of APS help, they can call Adult Protective Services. Of course, if someone recognizes themselves that they do need assistance, they may call on their own behalf. Social Service Law 473B provides immunity from civil liability to persons who, in good faith, refer an adult whom they believe may be in danger or in need of protective services. In other words, all that means is we can't tell anyone who called in a referral. Next slide. Next slide. Now is the time for if you have any questions for Joanne or myself, here's your golden opportunity to ask those questions. And we do have a few questions. So I'm just gonna go in the order in which they came in. Um, I think this first one is a question for Joanne. Are you seeing reductions in state funding for things like ICEP due to budget cuts at the state level? Great, thank you for the question. And um, at, at this time, um, we have not been advised of, of any reduction at the state level. I do know that um, the governor of the state uh, can reopen the budget on a, um, that I, I think uh, every three months, quarter, that would be quarterly, right? Quarterly basis. So there may be something in the future, but uh, right now, in fact, I just had a meeting with all of these uh, state directors yesterday. And uh, right now, no, the answer to that would be no, not yet. Okay. Thankfully. Thanks. Okay. Uh, APS question. Can the client characteristics for APS be one of the bullet points under a characteristic, or does the person need to be exhibiting all bullet points under a characteristic? They need to exhibit all of the characteristics. The bullet points are just examples of what that cat what would be considered for that characteristic but they need to have all three it's not like you can just have one or have the other they have to have all three of those before a referral is accepted okay thank you another one for um you natalie for aps have you seen an increase or decrease in demand for services now, because the person says they worry about abuse and exploitation not being reported now due to the due to the pandemic. Actually, we just um, looked at a few of our statistics and in the last month or so, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, everything slowed down. We weren't getting that many referrals. However, as things are opening up and people are out and about more, our referrals have kind of skyrocketed. Um, we actually are getting more referrals now in the last, I'd say four to six weeks, more now than we had last year at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, this one says senior services. What is the procedure for a family advocate to follow to make a referral for a family of seniors, for seniors in the Liverpool area? 
So should they specifically contact Neighborhood Advisor in Liverpool? Um, they're saying they think they know someone in Clay who could use ISEP services. So how do they figure out where to go for those services? Do they start in one place or do they have to go specifically to certain agencies? That's a great question and one that we receive a lot. All they need to do is call the Onondaga County Office for Aging and we will take that information and forward it to the appropriate neighborhood advisor. Because as I said earlier, we do have, some, we do have them in all, multiple agencies and we want to make sure that the person sees first the neighborhood advisor closest to home. So just call here and we will, we will connect them and make that referral. Okay. Um, another question, what organizations help seniors with money management in Onondaga County? Can you repeat the question, please? What organizations help seniors with money management in Onondaga County? If they have, um, if they're unable to manage their money, um, there is an agency that does it. It's CNY Services. They will assist with money management, um, particularly um, in those people who may need a representative payee um, assigned from Social Security so that their bills um, like rent or mortgage or na national grid or those type of bills need to be paid. Okay, thank you. Um, one last question for APS. Are you allowed to share results from an investigation with the individual who made the report or phone call? Usually what happens is the um, as we call them, the source of the referral, once the investigation is completed, they will receive a letter letting them know um, whether or not the assessment, which is what we refer to at the referral, if that assessment um, was closed, meaning that we didn't find any of those um, things in the referral to be needed or we had um, moved them and did the appropriate referrals for that person, they'll receive a letter saying that assessment is closed. That will usually happen within the 60 day period. If it is going to take longer than the 60 days to connect people with those resources, then they, the, the source of the referral will, see, re, will receive a letter stating that that referral is moving from an assessment stage to an ongoing stage to allow for time for the worker to um, hook someone up with the appropriate services. Okay. Um, one last thing, no new questions coming in, but a couple of requests for the PowerPoint um, and to get the contact information for the two of, uh, for our two presenters. Um, if you are interested in that, please send me an email and I will get that to you. It's ldicapriolee at verahouse.org and I would be happy to get that information to you. Um, so no more questions at this time. I want to thank Joanne and Natalie for that great presentation and great information. And um, just thank all of you for participating in this. And with that, we will end the session. So thank you, everyone, and goodbye.